by the drowning of a young child that took place on Friday night and was confirmed that she passed on uh, late on Monday. So I just think it's very important that we hold her and her family in our hearts right now before we do the business at hand. So please join me in a moment of silence. As we come back to the room, let's keep her and her family in our hearts throughout the day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. All right. Good, after, good morning, everyone. This is the Wednesday morning, August 30th, 2023 session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Wheeler. Here. We'll now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you were a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up is communications item number 709. First individual, please. Request of Kelly Byerman to address council regarding crime in our beloved city. Uh, Kelly was planning to join us virtually. They haven't arrived yet. All right, very good. We'll move to the next person for the time being. Item number 710, please. Request of Coleman Garrity to address council regarding measure 110. They canceled their request. 711, please. Request of Andre Tokayuk to address council regarding Portland Police Bureau. Andre was planning to join in person. Are you Andre? Andre. Oh, come on up. Yeah, come on up. Thank you for being here. Make yourself at home. Just uh, sit in the middle. Microphone about six inches away is ideal. And if Thank you could you, just sir. tell us your name for the record, that'd be appreciated. I'm Andre Grigorovich Tokayuk. Good morning, council. Good morning. Uh, People of Portland, I came here in 1988 with my father seeking freedom from an oppressive regime of the USSR. I was 12. My father was being persecuted and I, th I thought it was a good idea for him to leave and I went with him. While here, I can't say we have found a less oppressive regime. We both have really enjoyed our one freedom of speech. But here's what I experienced. You have a for-profit quote-unquote justice system that whose business model seems to be to defraud and devalue the taxpayer's labor by any legal means necessary. You have a culture of police corruption that rewards crooked cops and does not punish them for perjuries or breaking the law to enforce the law, which doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if you're breaking the law to enforce the law, you're a criminal and you should be held accountable. You have zero mechanism to hold these cops accountable at all. I mean, the IPR and the previous commission have done any, nothing for me. I've had my last eight years ruined by two cops who lied multiple times, whose story changed three times from the original report to the DMV case to the actual court. And your public defenders sell their defendants out for a paycheck, and you have complicit judges in this fleecing of the populace, like Judge Henry Cantor, who accepted document signed under duress. I never wanted to be rich. I just wanted to be, to do what I love, be a productive member of society, 
and find a good woman and continue the bloodline of my ancestors. You have shut the door in my face and all of these, which is why I describe Portland as the city where dreams come to die. Having lost my license in 2016, I find myself with less rights than the drug zombies you enabled every one of my tax dollars. They can live and drive cars full of trash, and I have to bike in the rain in the gutters, passing for bike lanes just to make you a buck before I can eat. I cannot even take care of my father, who's 77 and is barely fit to drive. I can't take care of my mom, who's back in Ukraine, 78. I'm torn between worlds, and uh, I have no recourse. Basically, you have, I've, I've experienced the crooked cops throughout my whole life. I mean, it was always some small victimless crime. I mean, the first, my first offense was a Measure 11 offense where I tried to, to get my stack of CDs from an ex-girlfriend. And that was like, you know, I went downhill from there. Every time the system touches you, it seems like it's just took a big dump, wept, wept its butt with its hands and just wipes it on you. And you can't wash that stuff off. It never comes off. And I, I see my only recourse is to go die for Ukraine and I'm, I'm just gonna have to leave your city. I'd love some help, but this is my last cry and nobody, nobody's really helping me, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next individual, 712, please. Request of Michael Axelrod to address council regarding illegal fireworks. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for being here. I'm Mike Axelrod. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Portland City Council, first I want to express my gratitude for your dedicated efforts in serving our city. Today I stand or sit before you, not only as a concerned resident, but also as someone who appreciates the work that you do to enhance the quality of life in our community. Now, I would like to talk about a matter that deserves a bit of attention, and that's the issue of illegal fireworks in our neighborhoods. I must admit that a bit of sizzle and sparkle can be quite exhilarating during celebrations. However, when my neighbor decided to turn our quiet block into a mini fireworks extravaganza that lasted an entire hour, I couldn't help but feel like we were auditioning for a big budget action movie. As I picked up my phone to report the noise and sparks, I realized I was in for more, a more challenging quest than Frodo's journey to Mount Doom. Attempting to call the non-emergency number felt like dialing a secret code to enter an exclusive club. In an attempt to address this concern, I wrote heartfelt complaints to my elected commissioner and the mayor, but I don't believe anything's been done. I don't want to just complain. To start, I propose that a section of the city website be created to allow reporting of specific instances of illegal firework use. This information should be relayed to the police department. I further propose that at least a week before the July 4th holiday, a small police detachment visits the reported homes to let the tenants know that they have been reported and are on a list for possible inspection during the holiday. I don't think this should increase any city costs, and I believe just a discussion should discourage at least half of those talked to. Fires ignited by fireworks are more than just a visual spectacle. They're a serious threat to our homes, our environment, and the safety of the city. The air quality that we all cherish takes a hit, causing discomfort and health issues for our residents, particularly those with respiratory conditions. And amidst the chaos, the peace and comfort of our neighbors including the youngest members and our beloved animals are undeniably compromised. As we discuss the need for enforcement and communication, let's remember the bigger picture. The flashing lights and booming sounds might offer a moment of exhilaration, but it's our responsibility to ensure that they don't overshadow the safety, peace, and well-being of this community. In closing, I implore you to consider the serious consequences of illegal fireworks, the fires, the air quality concerns, and the discomfort inflicted upon our residents and pets. Your continued dedication to our city's well-being can truly make a difference. By addressing this issue, you can help us all breathe easier, both figuratively and literally. Thank you. Thank you. C could I ask you uh, just a question? For first of all, I, I empathize with you completely, just so you're clear on where I stand. Um, is there some reason why you and your neighbors have not approached this particular neighbor? I did approach them. them. I asked them to stop. And what did they say? Uh, go pound sand. Really? Okay. Yes. 
Um, is this something we could handle through Civic Life? Yes, I think, I think it's uh, more than just Civic Life. I think it would be an all-in effort. I'd be working with uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. I think we got some really great suggestions from the testimony. It's an example of we have a policy and people are asking for us to have some community um, opportunity to be a part of the solution and so that we can actually implement the policy that we passed. Yeah. So I look forward to working with all my colleagues on this. So Fourth of July is often a tough day for 911, uh, for, uh, and we ask folks not to call uh, 911 for fireworks, but because there's so many instances, it tends to clog up the non-emergency. But I do wonder about 311 and a website as a potential supplement, because in, it's not often known, but non-emergency are the same call takers as uh, 911. So when one's busy, the other ones get squeezed out as, as well, unfortunately. But I, I just think that a lot of the folks that do this are habitual offenders, do it often. We know who they are. There is efforts that can be taken prior to the holiday when the lines get congested that could make an impact. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I know. I like the idea, and I like the idea of a website that people could submit a form to. I just, it's mostly how we navigate. So let's, we'll take back the idea. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 713. Yeah, Request of Brian Tobias to address council regarding houselessness. Noise. Ryan was planning to join in person. Ryan Tobias. I can't keep that straight. All right, now I'll, I'll go back to the front of the list. Did uh, where did it go? Yeah, did uh, did Kelly Byerman show up? Okay, we'll take a two minute recess till our first time. So actually, let's go to the consent agenda. Let's take care of that. Have any items been pulled from the consent agenda? One item has been pulled, item 715. 715 has been pulled from the consent agenda. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wheeling? Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. We're in a two minute recess.
seven different organizations managed by five independent commissioners to coordinate despite conflicting priorities and requirements, which was to say the least frustrating for our community as well as our own workforce trying to serve the public. As the recent Oregonian editorial stated, that structure, quote, forces developers, builders, and homeowners to go through permitting processes with multiple bureaus that give conflicting information and show little, little urgency, unquote. Simultaneously, permitting employees are reporting to several managers who often lack overall responsibility for decision making and or approval. Of course, of course, those coordinating challenges are not limited to permitting, and we can all look forward to a city administrator better coordinating the complex activities associated with the delivery of local public services. As we await those structural changes, the Permit Improvement Task Force, led by Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Maps, has continued to push forward with remarkable improvements, including a 30% reduction of permit review time. That's real progress that Portlanders can feel. I want to thank my colleagues and the folks who served on the Permit Improvement Task Force for your innovative work and your tireless leadership. And still, as our Infrastructure Bureau directors stated in their recent letter to Council, we have a ways to go to truly improve the permitting situation in our city. They highlighted a need for customer focused for a customer focused website, a clear central point of contact, and a set of code that is both streamlined as well as harmonized. In addition, they suggested that infrastructure bureaus merge under one umbrella. I support all of their recommendations, of course, as do all of my colleagues, which is why council has worked together to bring this resolution forward today. As Commissioner Rubio has urged over the last several months, this is our chance to have one unified team placing all permitting functions under one accountable permitting authority. This is how we build on the momentum of this task force. Change will, of course, be difficult, but Portlanders want us to do better, and we now have a path to do so. With that, I'll hand this off to Commissioner Rubio to provide an overview of the resolution, as well as to uh, invite or uh, in introduce our invited testimony. Commissioner Rubio, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. As all of you know, the city of Portland is on the cusp of changing its form of government, and that's at the direction of voters, and our work on that is well underway. The city council, beginning with the mayor's action earlier this year to create service areas, is going above and beyond that. And we are all actively working within our service areas to break down silos and within the transition team in OMF to better organize our city in preparation of our first city administrator. We want a ready and optimally organized city so that, so that that person is set up for success from day one. But there's a larger set of beneficiaries to our reorganization, reorganization efforts as well. And that is, of course, uh, the Portlanders that we serve each and every day. And for this resolution, we're talking about those Portlanders and partners who are small business owners, homeowners, housing developers, small companies, and larger firms that lead uh, redevelopment projects that are coming um, our way. Uh, also, large firms that lead massive redevelopment projects like OMSI, Albina, Lloyd, and, Mul uh, and Montgomery Park, just to name a few. And for far too long, Many of these folks and entities who are really our partners in growing and shaping this city have struggled to navigate our permitting system. And in plain language, that means that they've struggled to add that additional, that additional capacity that they need, like a, a refrigerator for their restaurant or that additional bathroom for a growing family or a desperately needed affordable multifamily housing project representing future homes for Portlanders and their families. The situation is challenging and has been for decades. And as many of you know, the problem in the debates and the discussions about solutions date back to well back into the 90s, perhaps even prior than that. But 25 plus years is significant enough to underscore that the theme about implementing an ideal structure has been a challenge for the city. And that isn't to say that there haven't been notable efforts along the way. There have been many commissioners before, like Commissioner Randy Leonard and others who have fought for this. And most recently, the excellent work of the current task force in its first two years have been incredibly important in foundational um, learning and knowledge and sharing so that we can arrive at this point today. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of my colleagues, Commissioner Ryan and Maps, 
for starting this critical and foundational step, and also for Terry Tyson and her team and their great work. And now in this time of government transition, a time when we're also struggling to recover economically, and we're also asking businesses to double down on Portland and facing an overwhelming housing crisis, we do need change. And fairly or unfairly, the permitting frustrations remain and have grown both inside and outside of city government. And the backdrop of the multiple challenges only elevates the need for urgency. And these are the reasons behind the presentation of this resolution today. It directs us to begin the process of consolidating the city's permitting services within one new entity with one authority and structure by July 1, 2024. And the vision for the work is this, a system that is accessible and predictable for our external partners who are investing their time and treasure into the community. Two, a system that cultivates a team culture where city employees are supported and working with each other collaboratively and where we have the ability to untangle conflicting policy approaches for a collective understanding. Three, a system that employees or technology that the city council can consistently and de dependably, dependably invest to retain our valuable and experienced employees and attract new talent as well. I want to be clear that this isn't the only strategy, but structure and authority are a fundamental one that will set a framework or a container to hold all the great processes and collaborative work that is currently happening through the permitting task force. In addition, all of the active work on code development, code cleanup, regulatory reform, website improvements, and technology investments must continue. There is no one solution to these shared set of, set of challenges. We need to do it all. And the permit task force will be the optimal pos position to, play, to build upon the last few years of foundational work and collaboration and drive this new work as we move forward. Numerous stakeholders are watching, including our governor, Tina Kotek, and members of the state's Housing Production Advisory Commission, who have expressed publicly and privately numerous times their clear support um, and her clear support for this step today. So after today, we start in earnest to build the permitting team we need to help the city economic, economically and to deliver the, on the 120,000 homes that we need to build for current and future Portland families. With all the exceptional expert experience that we have among our employees, I have no doubt the outcome will be incredi incredibly significant for our customers and ultimately vulnerable people at the heart of the housing crisis. So with that, I would like now to begin hearing from our invited testimony. And today we have with us, I'll just read the quick list and then turn it over to the, to the council clerk to facilitate, no? Okay. I'll, read the list and invite them up. Um, we have Andrew Colas from Colas Construction, Sarah Radcliffe from Habitat for Humanity, Ryan Nielsen from Lyuna 737, Preston Korst from Home Builders Association, Jamison Luce from Ethos Development and Smart Growth, and Christy White of Radler White. So we'll start with Andrew Colas. Good morning, Mayor, uh, Commissioner Rubo, Rubio, and fellow commissioners. Uh, my name is Andrew Colas. I am president of Colas Construction, uh, born and raised in Portland, Oregon. This is my city. This is uh, my state. I, I love this city. And um, I wanted to come here and say that I fully support this permitting consolidation. I've been in the construction and development industry all my life. Uh, my father started our company, and I've watched um, the city grow. And I've seen the, the permitting process not grow at the pace that the city needs. And it's really burdensome to uh, the needs that we have now. And in, they're more evident than ever, the need for more housing, uh, both affordable housing and market rate housing uh, is very visible uh, when, when you walk around our city. And, and the fact is the permitting process is delaying that uh, substantially. Uh, being able to consolidate this um, and have one point is going to dramatically help exp expedite this process. And it's not only housing, which is a critical need that we all have, it's also the development of new drug uh, and alcohol treatment uh, centers that, that we so desperately need in our city. It's new hospital facilities. It's uh, the ability to recruit um, more commercial uh, 
commercial uh, residents in the downtown core. Um, to be able to fast track this is gonna be really critical to our city moving forward in the future. So I just wanna say that I strongly support it and, and there really is a cost impact to our city if we do not support it. The longer these projects go, stay in the permitting process, the more expensive they get. And, and we need to do our best to drive down the cost of housing in our city so that we can be a more affordable city and, and continue to grow our city in the way that we all believe it, it should and, and, and can be. So again, I want to strongly say that I support this and I hope that you all vote uh, to support it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we have Sarah Radcliffe from Habitat. Good morning, my name is Sarah Radcliffe, Director of Government Relations with Habitat for Humanity. Today I'm speaking on behalf of Housing Oregon as co-chair of the Portland Metro Policy Council. Housing Oregon supports today's resolution to unify permitting functions. We believe the steps outlined in this resolution will go a long way towards creating a more easily navigable permitting system that will contribute to faster and increased production of affordable housing in Portland. With over 90 member organizations, Housing Oregon is a statewide association of affordable housing community development corporations committing to, committed to serving and supporting low-income Oregonians across the housing needs spectrum, from homeless to homeowner. Housing Oregon's Portland Metro Policy Council members voted to support this proposal at their August 9th meeting. Housing Oregon members agree we need one permitting team under one authority to create the accessible, predictable system we need to build affordable housing. The kaleidoscope of bureaus our members must engage with to address normal revisions, adjustments, and corrections can take anywhere from six to 12 months or more just to get approval to begin building new housing. With voter approved charter reforms, we believe that now is the time to consolidate the city's fragmented permitting functions into one entity. The, this resolution lays out the framework for a plan that can create a singular permitting office with adequate funding to get the job done. Thank you for taking our comments into consideration and for your public service to our community. Thank you, Sarah. Next we have Ryan Nielsen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Nielsen. I'm the political rep for Laborers Local 737. We are a labor union representing thousands of construction laborers across the state, uh, many of whom live or work in the city of Portland. We're very supportive of this resolution. Um, you know, as a union, we have an apprenticeship program. And when permitting is long and fraught with unpredictability, it frankly just becomes a lot harder for us to predict um, when and how we're going to provide apprentices onto uh, different construction projects around the city. So when we have a more predictable and streamlined process, this is going to have a real uh, direct impact on getting apprentices onto jobs. And that quite literally translates into getting more women and people of color into long-term careers with strong family wages, full family health care, pension and retirement benefits. Um, and that's how we build intergenerational wealth. Um, you know, I just want you all to know that permitting really does impact workers in the trades, uh, even though it's kind of down the, the, the hierarchy of the process. Um, and it does have real impacts on equity and what the trades look like. Um, so when we uh, hopefully centralize permitting functions into one bureau uh, and streamline the tools that we're using, uh, this is a great step towards solving our problems and it's a great step towards making our city better for workers. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Next we have Preston Horst. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Preston Korst. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Home Building Association of Greater Portland. I am here on behalf of our 1,200 members um, working both regionally and within the City of Portland to um, express our strong support for Agenda Item 714, um, the permit unification process. Um, and I wanna just first start off by thanking uh, Commissioner Rubio and her team for um, spearheading this effort, as well as Commis uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez and Mayor Wheeler for bringing it forward today. Um, and I also do want to take a moment to recognize uh, Commissioner uh, Ryan and uh, Commissioner Maps for um, standing up the Permit Improvement Task Force, which no doubt helped us get to where we are today um, in improving the system, but also um, hopefully informing what we do uh, down the road um, it should Council decide to pass this um, resolution. Uh, so as I, you know, just sort of think, think aloud here, 
Um, I'd like to call attention, um, call your attention to the um, written testimony that um, we had submitted just yesterday. Um, I think I was the one that submitted it, but we had over, uh, we had 15 um, separate organizations signing on to a single letter um, supporting this effort, uh, which in and of itself, I think is something to uh, commend and sort of recognize the fact that uh, this proposal has overwhelming consensus and um, acknowledgement that it will not only improve housing production, but also housing affordability in the long run. So um, that alone, I think, is uh, a signal to how popular this will be and how, um, how needed it is. Because I think builders um, operating in the city of Portland for, uh, for too long have recognized the inherent dysfunction that getting one permit through seven different bureaus can cause. So certainly, uh, we are supportive of consolidating this under one roof. Um, as many have already mentioned, having a hub of expertise and knowledge and, of course, authority will make it easier for builders to have predictability um, and uh, confidence going forward with uh, constructing the needed housing we need um, in, in the city. Um, I would also like to just uh, take a moment and, if we could, um, as we move forward, should council approve this, um, I want to um, encourage uh, each of you to continue to invest your time and attention to the implementation of this resolution should it pass, um, as well as recognize the need for uh, continued funding and support that um, it will no doubt need. It's not going to fix everything right at once, but certainly it will have uh, an outsized impact in supporting more housing in the city of Portland. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jameson Luce. Good morning. Uh, yeah, Jameson Lewis, resident of North Portland. Um, I work for Ethos Development, a local multifamily developer, and am on the board of Oregon Smart Growth. Um, I would like to voice my full support for the resolution to consolidate the permitting process and thank City Council for prioritizing these improvements, um, ensuring timely reviews and predictable overall permit durations that are needed improvements. Um, and just as an antidote, I've experienced firsthand the inefficiencies of having projects shuffled back and forth between different bureaus. Um, Ethos is under construction for a co-living project in Northeast Portland um, that will provide units between 50 and 60% AMI. Um, within weeks of breaking ground, we encountered undocumented fill and had to submit a permit revision. Uh, we submitted on August 15th last year. We were told that the review would take two to four weeks. Uh, we didn't get a response until November 16, 2022, with, uh, excuse me, we got a response um, in October and then didn't get the actual approval until November 16, 2022, uh, with minimal changes to the plan. Um, this was a major blow to the project. Um, this is a kind of workforce housing project that has no public subsidy. Um, and what was a costly delay turned into a catastrophic delay. Um, we blew through all our contingency and also had to invest additional uh, equity in the project just to keep it going. Um, so my hope is that the permit consolidation will improve the efficiency of reviews and allow us to develop housing at all income levels across the city. Um, and I just want to voice that uh, Oregon Smart Growth members take pride in our city and want to invest in building housing here. Uh, we look forward to working with city council and permitting staff as we implement this consolidation plan and are open um, for discussion or help on any other process improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last we have Christy White. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Christy White. I've been working in the land use field in the city of Portland for nearly 30 years and I appreciate this invitation to speak to you about this important project. At first glance, this sounds like one of those kind of bland, unimportant moments in the arc of a bureaucracy. But it is much more important than that. As Malcolm Gladwell put it, quote, the single most important thing a city can do is to provide a community where interesting, smart, and diverse populations want to and can live and work with their families. We are struggling to build towards that objective. Our housing production is down over 80%, our office vacancy is echoing, and our neighborhoods are suffering with increasing crime and houseless populations. People are in great need of our best effort to right this ship. This resolution is one such measure, and it is hopeful. It recognizes that by increasing permit efficiency 
and reducing time to permit, we can build out of our housing crisis at all levels of income, recreate and reimagine our sense of collective community through the built environment and welcome people back into the city to live and work and play with their families. This resolution importantly stands for the proposition that a conflict between two bureaus or two codes will no longer occupy the high ground. Instead, those bureaus will be required to resolve that inner conflict in favor of a new high ground, which is to issue a permit to build that next affordable housing project or entertainment ve venue or job center. It's gonna take us a while to catch up as you just heard from Ethos. Today, it actually can take three to four years to get from start of design to final occupancy through our permit process. We just have to move much faster and this resolution helps us do that. Aligning the bureaus and requiring that every person responsible for permitting is rowing in the same direction with the same urgency and the same intent is critical to the success of our common purpose. Thank you so much for your leadership on this and in supporting this re resolution and in any further and hopefully continuing efforts at regulatory reform. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I was remiss, we have one more um, invited testifier, George Carrillo from Latino Built. Welcome, George. Hello, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mayor and City Commissioners. You know, on behalf of Latino Build, we would like to express our strong support for the city's consolidation of permitting functions. We believe that the creation of a singular and efficient permitting office will streamline the process, allowing for increased economic development and providing opportunities for affordable housing for all. Now, as you know, Portland has experienced significant growth in population over the past decade. While there have been policy changes and investments to support new housing, the permitting process has remained fragmented and insufficient. Builders and developers have faced numerous challenges, including lengthy processing times, inconsistencies, and confusion due to a kaleidoscope of bureaus, regulations, and varying codes. This is why we strongly support the consolidation of permitting functions into one office with adequate funding and uniform technology. By simplifying the process and creating an authority to resolve disputes, we believe that Portland can foster a more equitable and productive building industry with fewer barriers. Latino built represents businesses and workers in the construction industry, many of whom have faced these challenges firsthand. We believe that cr the creation of a singular permitting office will not only benefit the builders and developers in our industry, but also benefit the entire community. It will create new job opportunities, promote economic vibrance, and improve housing affordability by streamlining the time-consuming and costly process of building homes. We also recognize that the permitting processes is complicated, and we applaud the city's efforts through ongoing regulatory improvement code amendment projects. However, we believe that a fundamental overhaul of the current system is necessary to achieve lasting improvements. We urge the city council to move forward with a plan that creates a unified permitting office. The construction industry stands ready to support and contribute our expertise in various ways to aid this critical effort. We ask that you approve to make this efficient for everyone and also acknowledge the fact that we as builders and developers, we need this reform, but most importantly, Portlanders need this reform. They need housing and at an affordable rate. And we must continue to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of government? If government is in the way by creating too many barriers, then we must create the reform to make it function for all individuals 
not just for the sector of construction, but for the homeowner itself. So we ask that you move this forward today. Thank you very much and thank you for your time. Thank you, George. Mayor, we'll turn it back to you. Very good, thank you. Thanks for everybody who provided testimony. Do we have public testimony? We have eight people signed up. Three minutes each, thank you for the record. First up is Jill Krop. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Jill Krop. I'm an architect who's been working in Portland since 2021. And these days I'm the owner of Studio Crop Architecture where I focus on new residential construction of mostly middle housing infill projects in Portland. Uh, I'm also a member of DRAC. I've been doing that for about a year and a half uh, where I represent home, the home builder stakeholder group. Uh, but today I'm just speaking on behalf of myself as a professional, building professional and as a proud native Portlander. Um, I had a whole uh, speech prepared, but I must say that Commissioner Rubio and Mayor Wheeler and the previous speakers have covered a lot of the kind of high level stuff that I was gonna cover. So I just wanna say that um, I'm a, I run a lot of permits, so I'm in the weeds every day. Um, and I'm also really involved in um, a lot of the technological changes that have happened with how we're doing permitting and um, Initially, the beginning of the pandemic, it was messy and frustrating, but I will say after three years, I think we've seen really big improvements. And I've seen the preview of what's coming to make a lot of the permit submittal and correction submittal be even better. Um, so I'm excited about that. The problems that I still see are a lot of these kind of nitpicky administrative processes that are different between the bureaus and it causes delays even a week or two delay for the size of projects that I do can make a really big impact on the overall cost of the project. And so I don't see how a lot of those problems are gonna get solved until we're all under one bureau for permitting. So I didn't say that, but I do wholeheartedly support um, this proposal to bring permitting under one umbrella and also to support and fund the, the permitting task force, the transition team, the technology and continuous process team, and all of the website plans that we have coming up. Uh, I'm really excited to see that council is so unified on this issue, so thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Next up, we have Eli Spivak. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Eli Spivak, and I'm here in support of this resolution. I'm a builder through my company, Orange Splot, and I serve on DRAC, um, where I'm a planning commissioner representative, where I also serve. But this testimony is for me as an individual. Um, I've been taking projects through Portland's permit system since the mid-90s. Back then, I wasn't aware of the 97 audit recommendation to centralize permit review functions, but it was clearly needed then and definitely needed now. I've heard some explanations over the years for why Portland's permit processes are slow and challenging compared with other jurisdictions. I've worked in Gresham and Clark County and have that experience myself. Um, despite what seems to be solid staffing by folks trying to do a good job. Some seem credible, the explanations, um, such as complexity of regulations or permit volume, but the underlying issue clearly stems from the decentralized reviews process with different reviewers ultimately reporting to different bosses all the way up to different city commissioners. When I develop projects, mostly in the 40 to, 4 to 20 unit range, I usually run them through the permit process personally, partly because I'm a glutton for punishment, but mostly to see how the system works from the ground, so I don't rely on reports from other builders saying hair-raising stories of how bad things went. Right now, I'm building middle housing, a three-plex. I've got six-plex I just picked up permits for, and another one's in pre-issuance. And I've had my share of hair-raising stories and their pain, but overall, I'd say the Portland permitting staff have done the best they can despite the fragmented multi-bureau structure. So I appreciate this resolution will change that. One place of potential concern I could imagine is that a reviewer outside of water or BES or transportation or forestry might miss critical issues because they're not in the Bureau with field expertise and regulatory expertise. Um, but I think that there's a solution to this, and I think back to the code I know the most, which is the zoning code. It's developed by planners. 
It's implemented by BDS staff. It has been for years. And I know when I get my check sheets from zoning, um, they're almost always right, um, which means somehow the BDS staff are implementing someone else's code correctly. I think that can be done with the other bureaus as well. There's still some, definitely some items that need fixing independent of this resolution, like the way check sheet responses are uploaded. It's a pain in the neck. It takes a long time. And um, more predictability around offsite costs to projects and the process to design offsite improvements. Um, but they're already on the to-do list. I hope they can happen concurrently. So lastly, I'm excited this proposal is going forward. I hope that DRAC will be seen as a resource in the process. And as the Chinese proverb sort of goes, the best time to follow audit, the best time to follow audit recommendations was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Allison Reynolds online. Good morning. Good morning, counselors. Um, I'm Allison Reynolds. I'm a land use attorney with Stoll Reeves, and I'm also here today as a member of Oregon Smart Growth. Um, I want to first thank all of you for bringing this resolution forward, and I also want to recognize all the work by your offices and the Bureau staff members to try to get to the root of the issue and figure out what we can do to address um, this kind of thorny and, and multifaceted program. I work with developers and owners who want to invest in Portland and create new housing here. Unfortunately, the current permitting system is unpredictable and often lengthy, which leads to higher costs and some of the firms that I speak with deciding that they want to build their projects in neighboring jurisdictions where these delays happen less often or where our predictions about how long things will take can be more accurate. Under the city's current system, projects can get caught up in unexpected conflicts between bureau regulations. And this is obviously frustrating for the development teams, but I think it's also frustrating for city staff who are trying to do their jobs, but are separated into silos under the current system. And so I strongly support this resolution as a first step to try to address the systemic issues that lead to these unnecessary delays. And thank you all for your leadership on this issue. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Jonathan Clay in person. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, commissioners and, and Mayor Wheeler, I'm Jonathan Clay. I'm testifying on behalf of Multifamily Northwest. We are the leading membership organization representing owners, operators, developers of rental housing um, in Oregon, and we currently operate uh, to or represent 275,000 rental units, and we wholeheartedly support the, the city permitting reform out outlining to outline today in um, uh, Council Item 714. This bold plan re represents a breath of fresh air, promising to fuel sustainable development bolster economic vitality and enhance the overall quality of life for our for our residents. Uh, as we've heard many examples of already this 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 morning Portland per, per, Portland's permitting rules have often been criticized from all sides for their complexity their their red tape and and delay um, by simplifying uh, this maze this plan aims to facilitate the construction of new housing Units, which in turn will help alleviate the mounting pressure on Portland's housing, uh, Portland's housing market. We believe uh, this approach represents a real chance to be more collaborative and produce uh, and uh, be more co collaborative and and a productive relationship between the public and private sectors. Um, uh, and this plans emphasis on affordable housing units and workforce housing also ensures that economic progress is accessible to all members of the of the community so thank you very much mayor wheeler and the portland city commissioners for, for bringing this proposal forward as leaders of the rental housing industry multifamily norton northwest is grateful for this solution or or for this solution oriented approach to this long standing problem thank you Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, next up, we have Rachel Whiteside. Hi, Rachel. Good 
Good morning, commissioners and Mayor Wheeler. I'm here on behalf of Protect 17 members. Uh, they are the body of members that do the majority of the permit review, whether it's for the Bureau of Development Services or their interagency partners across the city. And uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that our members absolutely agree that we are in the midst of a housing crisis. Uh, but we don't believe that an expedited consolidation is the hope for magic bullet and fails to focus on the real obstacles as they are experienced by our members. That includes understaffing within review groups, overly complex codes that don't adequately address what to do in the event of a conflict, inexperienced management teams, and the separation of permit reviewers from those who are authorized to make decisions. Um, not just this council, but councils before have intentionally and systematically placed the burden of paying for permit review on developers as opposed to making it a service uh, of this uh, city. And I think that has contributed to, and this resolution doesn't address adequately the funding needed to have proper staffing. Um, it also, uh, I think, fails to recognize that when you separate the permit reviewers from the policy writers, um, that that either leads to further disconnect or potentially the doubling up of review staff in order to make code fixes. And I can speak from personal experience at the Bureau of Development Services that when land use review was separated from the Bureau of Planning, while we're still implementing that code, we have to be a part of every um, policy change or every code writing project. And that takes away from the focus of actually reviewing and uh, issuing permits. Let's see. Um, additionally, the public works bureaus, PBOT, BES, Water Bureau, they operate under a different mandate. They are permitting assets that are in the public right-of-way that will be owned and maintained by the city. And our members have great concern that moving the permitting teams out of these bureaus will break those links between the reviewers and the people that are responsible for constructing and maintaining these publicly owned assets. This could lead to increased costs for the city long-term. I have way more comments from members than clearly I have time. Uh, I guess what my direct ask is, uh, I think this resolution is going to come with a large financial cost at a time when there's too much change happening over the next year with the larger charter, larger charter transition to give this proposed consolidation the attention and resources required for it to result in the desired efficiencies. We think the weight of this body would be better used to support increased staffing, simplified and clarification of codes, training and performance improvement for managers, and setting expectations on how non-permitting staff within the interagency bureaus coordinate with permitting staff. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Next up, we have <laughs> Christina Dirks online. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler. Morning. Commissioners. My name's Christina Dirks. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at Home Forward, which is the Public Housing Authority for Multnomah County. I'm here to testify in support of today's permit consolidation resolution. Um, as you all likely know, Homes Forward mission is to assure that our community is sheltered. We serve over 15,500 low-income households in Multnomah County each month through affordable housing and administering rent assistance. We currently have 563 additional units under construction right now in the city. And within the next three years, we'll have an additional 492 units under development in the city of Portland. We know from firsthand experience that the city's current permitting system is in desperate need of reform. At best, the current system is confusing, cumbersome, and causes unneeded delays. And at worst, the bureaus are working at odds, creating contradictory requirements and stifling development. Hope Forward is in full support of this long overdue step towards permit consolidation in order to advance housing production. We support the proposed structure of a single permitting agency with a single decision maker. We believe this structure is key as it would allow for consistent policies and practices, the streamlining and acceleration of process improvements and holistic decision making around staffing and budgeting. 
In addition, we think this structure will increase transparency by more clearly holding accountable um, the city for the customer experience, as well as the advancement of the city's racial equity goals and strategies. We do ask as part of this permit consolidation for the continuation and expansion of the fast track permitting process for affordable housing development that was um, recommended and adopted as a pilot by the Government Accountability Transparency Results Workgroup. However, under the current fast tracking model, only affordable housing that receives city of Portland money is eligible. And we know that the need for affordable housing is great and it remains highest amongst our communities of color. So we are asking that we expand this fast tracking for the development and preservation of all affordable housing in the city, regardless of whether it includes city funding. Um, and finally, we're thrilled that the council is committed to act with the speed and the resources commiserate with the need um, and are happy to see the July 1, 2024 implementation date. And uh, we thank you for your commitment to this reform and we know the future work that will go in to making it um, a reality. And Home Forward looks forward to the continuation of being a partner with the city in addressing housing access and housing stability for our low income neighbors. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Justin Wood online. Morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, well, good morning, Mr. Mayor and uh, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Justin Wood. I'm with Fish Construction Northwest, and I've been building in the Portland area for over 20 years. Uh, I am a former chair of the Development Review Advisory Committee. I was uh, served on DRAC and I was the chair a, a few years ago. This is nothing new. This is something we've been dealing with for many years. Um, one of the, the common complaints that we heard when I was on DRAC was trying to figure out how to streamline the permitting process and trying to how to figure out how to make this flow better. Currently, I am a member of the Governor's Housing Production Advisory uh, Council. I've been, I was appointed to that and have been serving on that. And we've been hearing from jurisdictions and builders and developers from across the state trying to figure out ways to, to make this better. Um, I, these, these comments are my own. They're not uh, uh, officially from the, the council. But one of the things I, I have heard from cities is that there is no magic bullet to solving our housing issues. But one of the things that we can do is try to figure out how, where cities can remove roadblocks and inefficiencies and costs. And I'm here to say that in the 20 years that I've been building in Portland, our current permitting system is adding a lot of delays and a lot of costs to actually getting permits out the door. Um, we, when I started building in 2000 in the city of Portland, it wasn't uncommon for me to be able to get a single family building permit out within four to six weeks. Um, now, I, it generally takes me six to nine months in that same range. Um, it's just the, the amount of different people looking at it and the amount of different delays and projects uh, that it takes it's, it's, it's just become very cumbersome and delaying and especially when at this day and age when we're seeing interest rates what we're where, where they're at uh, a delay of a month or two as somebody alluded to earlier can add thousands of dollars in delays to a cost of a project and that's just something that we can that we can fix if we can figure out how to get rid of the efficiencies i want to be careful because it seems like the bureau of development services a lot of times gets the negative attention when there's permit delays but it's been my experience that it's actually the 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 other bureaus as a part of the permit process that where we've seen more of the delays and those those is, those delays are not things that are directly controlled by the Bureau of Development Services. Um, we recently had a permit where one of the other bureaus um, what needed to do a fairly simple review on a permit and it took them four months to actually get to that review and do that release on the permit when uh, none of the other bureaus could actually sign off on that permit. So there's so it, having one person who's the point of contact on this and one person who can help shepherd these through the process in one bureau would be a huge help to us in the development community. And it would hopefully align with what we're trying to do on the Housing Production Advisory Council. So thank you and I wholeheartedly support this. Thank you. Uh, next up we have John Gibbon online. Welcome John. John, you're muted. Hi, I'm John Gibbon. Um, I live in Quail Park. Um, it's one of the examples that I have to point to uh, to say that I, well, I'm in support of this because I believe that yeah, housing should be treated with a yet, but with a yes, but with conditions standard for getting things done inside the city of Portland. I'm concerned. Quail Park is an, an absolute example. Commissioner 
uh, Ryan and the mayor will remember that three years ago, the 95 houses in Quail Park had to form an LID to build a new water system with the help of the city of Portland because building permits were given out when a temporary line was put in in the 1970s and we had 95 homes sitting with an inadequate water line uh, with only one connection to the city water system. Those are the kind of things that cannot be excused under this new program. But realistically, I've appeared before this council since 1976 and worked in the housing industry since 1980. And I will tell you that when I went to work for the Randall Company at that point, what I was stunned about was I could go to the city of Beaverton and the first meeting I had with the city of Beater Beaverton was in a facilities review meeting where the infrastructure bureaus were there signing off on telling people what they had to get done with the project. And the only time I saw that happen in the city of Portland was when BDS had a guy named Mike I call him Mike K because I am terrible with last names. And I think it was Mike Karahashi at BDS took charge of the subdivision and land division process in the 1990s, late in the 90s, when some of this stuff was discussed. And he made people come to meetings and drug fire bureau people in and water, not so much water bureau or BES people in kicking and screaming, but the fire guys didn't really want to be there. And Mike made them sign off early in the process. And that's the real problem here. Those conditions are not set down. The, you don't make sure the facilities get done. The guys over at the BDS are good people, but they just keep issuing permits when they need to know the res facilities are there. And that's the concern I have with this. I, I hope it doesn't work out that way. We're so far behind on housing that we need to get it fixed, but don't blow the infrastructure part of this component up with this program. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. That completes testimony. All right, very good. <laughs> Colleagues discussion, this is a resolution, so we will be taking a vote. Call the roll. Gonzalez. Simply put, we aren't producing enough housing and aren't drawing enough capital to the city. We sim this simultaneously undermines our ability to produce sufficient housing and to generate family wage jobs. Permit unification sends a clear signal. Portland is open for business. I spent a good time of my early career in real estate development across the country, to a certain extent across borders. At the time, Portland had some good reputation and some bad reputation nationally. The rules were somewhat transparent at the time. You could look them up online. This was a good thing. But the process was long and slow and required multiple sign-offs. And then you get run into arbitrary decision-making in different parts of the process that's unpredictable. Developers, investors need predictability. Portland has often lacked that. Um, I will say that there is no simple solution to uh, push through more permits. We need to have accountability. That's what unification does. But there's still a lot of work under the hood that's going to be required. Unifying systems in development is but one significant issue that we're going to have to pay very close attention to in this process. Um, it's a repeat concern for the city of Portland. You go to one bureau with one technological interface and a different bureau uh, with a different one. So that's something that we just need to pay attention as we go through this. But uh, I do want to call out that this, the work done on, on, on permit unification in some ways is a reflection of both the weaknesses and the strengths of the soon to be done uh, commission form of government. Our problems in permitting largely derive from having different commissioners oversee different bureaus. That is a contributing factor to this uh, issue. But I will say the way in which we came to a unified commitment as a council here uh, 
frankly, quite promptly, is good news. And I hope that we'll have more of these instances between now and uh, the end of next year. So I am a uh, strong yes on this. Thank you very much. Maps. Um, colleagues, I am proud to join you in co-sponsoring this resolution to reform Portland's famously troubled permitting system. Now, this resolution is a compromise, but it is a compromise that gets several things right. First, this resolution continues the work of the Permits Task Force, a group that Commissioner Ryan and I started over two years ago. Thanks to the work of that task force, in the last 18 months, the City of Portland has reduced the amount of time it takes to process permits for new home construction by 75%. I want to congratulate the members of the Permits Task Force on that amazing accomplishment and a job well done. And I want to remind the members of that Permit Task Force that our work is not done. The resolution before us today charges the Permit Task Force with de delivering some common sense and transformational reforms like building a new customer-focused website for permitting, streamlining the rules and procedures that govern permitting in the city of Portland, and eliminating conflict in code. Now, here's another thing the permit reform proposal before council gets right. The resolution before us today integrates our permitting reform efforts into the city's larger efforts to implement a new charter. In 16 months, the form of government Portland has used for the last 111 years will go away, and a new form of government led by a 12-member council, a mayor, and a city administrator will take its place. Now, that's a good thing. However, implementing charter reform also presents some challenges. For example, one obvious flaw with the permit reform efforts that Commissioner Ryan and I led was the fact that our efforts to improve Portland's permitting system were not coordinated with our parallel efforts to implement a new city charter. The resolution before us today fixes that flaw. There's a third thing about this resolution which I would like to praise. This resolution uh, directs the city to prepare for the consolidation of development review and permitting staff into one entity by July 1st, 2024. Now, let the historic record be clear. This is an important moment in Portland's history, and Commissioner Rubio deserves credit for making a consolidated permitting authority a reality here in Portland. Now, I will wrap up my comments today by thanking permit staff and the members of the Permit Task Force for their service to our city. I also have a plea. Please don't quit on us now. As we embark on the next chapter in our efforts to make Portland a great place to start and grow a family and business, we need your expertise and your innovation now more than ever. For these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. I want to first thank the mayor. Um, our discussions on this topic dates back to January of this year. And for you, I know it's been several years before that. And I sincerely appreciate your leadership and your partnership and the great work of your team. Um, and also to the numerous stakeholders who have been for years alerting us to your challenges. We, you have shared story after story and uh, for many years, and not only that, you've offered solutions. Um, and as I said in my remarks, consolidation is one big piece, but it is not the only piece. The ongoing code development, code cleanup, regulatory reform, form, et cetera, is to come, some of which will be at council before the end of the year. I want to thank my colleagues again, uh, Commissioner Dan Ryan and Mingus Maps for setting up the, ta the latest task force work uh, two years ago. Uh, that foundational work was incredibly important uh, to getting us here today, um, as well as to all our conversations. And I also want to especially lift up Commissioner Ryan for our com numerous conversations over the last two and a half years um, and for calling out early the need for collaborative systems change. Um, I also want to appreciate Commissioner Gonzalez and the thoughtful perspective and feedback in our discussions about these needed changes. Um, thank you for your thought partnership in this as well. 
And uh, thanks to the task force team led by Terry Tyson, I want to express my appreciation for your work to date and the important work ahead. And gratitude also to BDS Director Rebecca Esau and her team. Um, Rebecca, you are an infallible leader and it's a pleasure to get to work with you and your team every day. And also, um, as elected officials, I think I want to acknowledge our collective council staff um, and for all their great work. Um, and also, in particular, I want to give a big thank you to my chief of staff, Jillian Shoney, for her tireless work over the last multiple months. Thank you, Jillian, so much. And finally, much appreciation to all of the involved bureau directors, permit staff, and employees who work hard every single day on behalf of our city. Um, uh, I hear the comments and I agree with numerous comments about funding and ensuring that we have stable and um, uh, constant funding to ensure that we retain um, our excellent expertise that exists in our current staff. Um, and I will do everything in my power and I know my, co my colleagues will too to make sure that that um, is a reality. Um, permitting consolidation in the larger reorganization effort is one big and significant leadership opportunity and I know that each one of these folks wants what is best for Portland and our city government. And we have 10 months to deliver on this first piece with only 15 months to deliver on all the other pieces. So we have our work cut out for us, but I, I know that working together and with all of the experts at the table, I'm confident that we can get there. Happy to vote aye. Ryan. Thank you for all the compelling testimony this morning, and I hope all of you remain engaged as we partner to continue the improvement of this extremely important permitting system that has received all-in council attention for well over two years. Allow me to set some context here, as I was a commissioner overseeing BDS for the community from September 2020 until reassigned by Mayor Wheeler in the end of this um, last year, uh, December 2022. So first things first. I don't do history lessons too often, so just bear with me. We had to protect BDS for the collapse that occurred during the Great Recession of 2008. BDS is a fee-for-service revenue bureau, and we needed the bureau whole as we were navigating the challenges of working with customers during the early days of COVID. With the support of DRAC, the council came together and supported my proposal for the 21-22 budget, so we avoided the dramatic layoffs from 2008. After reviewing the critical audit of early 2021, I recruited an all-in effort to get to the bottom of our permitting challenges that have been plaguing our city for decades. Our multi-bureau system was not, only, was not only made up of seven actor bureaus and relentless code clutter that drives many of our most skilled and resourced customers nuts, and are for our residents of small businesses, they are left in shock with this complexity. I then asked Commissioner Maps to co-chair with me the building of a first ever task force that actually brought together all of the permitting bureaus. Past efforts were singular and focused only on BDS. Those efforts are often top down and seldom get the votes to move forward. As such, thank you Commissioner Maps for saying yes to this collective impact continuous improvement project that underscores the slogan, if you wanna go far, go together. If you wanna go fast, go alone. And what is implied there is you won't go very far. As such, it was necessary to keep all political offices engaged as we had consistent attendance at task force meetings where we did the following. For one, we got to know each other. It was fascinating to witness people who had been working and permitting for years who finally met one another, albeit through a Zoom meeting. We established data sets and quickly moved the data-driven culture that we've been needing for some time. And I wanna thank BDS and the many, many hours of putting together those data sets so we don't wait for a 10-year report from the auditor to tell us it's messed up. We actually had real-time data. It's very key. We conducted customer service professional development, and those really went over well. For example, after two emails, maybe you shouldn't keep emailing back and forth. Pick up the phone. We included um, two customer service surveys that included industries, big, small, affordable housing, et cetera, and we got their feedback, and we did that consistently for two years. We hired a team with actual job descriptions to implement this work, beginning with the hiring of Terry Tyson in the 21-22 budget, and we added two more continuous improvement professionals in 22 and 23, who constantly stay focused on practices and implementation and that's why we have momentum. We actually hire people to do the implementation work. Changing culture and building a team was a priority. That is the soil work. And now we must continue to move forward and harvest these rewards. 
and that, is nece that necessary foundation work has improved culture and engagement and results. Thank you to the hardworking permitting teams who have been working together across bureaus like never before. <clears throat> you have been empowered to identify gaps, set goals for reducing timelines, which have been accomplished, and improving customer service. Thank you, it's really been an honor and a blessing to observe that taking place over the last two years. As policymakers, we can further support this momentum by ensuring that the current work is resourced and continues. We must remain united in this vision in using data-driven solutions and measurement. We are also prioritizing this essential city service by asking that the chief administrative officer incorporate how we organize this service by identifying the single permitting authority. My experience tells me that organizational charts rarely solve issues that creates barriers to success. However, identifying a single decision maker is key, and that has been the a barrier that has been addressed for decades and has been a product of our ongoing form of government. We also need to continue to support what we know is needed throughout technology, website improvements, support for the recruitment and retention of skilled staff it takes up to a year for permitting staff to really get their bearings and have the capabilities to perform and continue to focus on the coding clutter that has been a pain for many, many years as we address the confusion, volume, and complexity. We can now support staff and customers in a clear point of authority, no longer leaving it to staff to sort out while customers try to predict the outcomes. Predictability, as mentioned by many of the testimony, is the best practice. I do want to stress that we are proposing today is complicated. It might take a few years to really experience the deep dive, how we need to fund and staff this service. So let's continue to stay engaged, all of our offices, as we implement this. No one can do this alone. As leaders, we need to be persistent and patient in supporting the staff to see these changes through. Finally, please remember unification begins and ends with all of us on the council. Our conflicts do not support the momentum that is currently in motion and the past couple of months have been rough on the culture. And so I hope today is also a refresh as we move forward as a united team. So yes to getting back on track to support our professionals, to serve our residents, our builders, our developers, to invigorate our economy and accelerate the building of more homes. This is important work. This is about implementation now, and we are all accountable to that. Practice does eat policy for lunch, because that is what Portlanders experience. Let's support this work. I vote aye. Wheeler. Thank you, everybody who provided testimony today. I think it's uh, notable and fantastic that the City Council is moving this forward collectively, unanimously today. And I want to thank Director Jordan and his staff for continuing to do the good work. I vote aye. And the resolution is adopted. To you, the regular agenda, 723, please. Accept bid of two KG contractors incorporated for the Washington Park Hypochlorite project for $1,509,561. Colleagues, the Portland Water Bureau's Washington Park Hypochlorite facility was constructed in 1981, and due to poor conditions, it's not currently operational. This item authorizes the Washington Park hypochlorite project to replace the hypochlorite system to meet operation and flow conditions, to add a necessary ammonia system, and upgrade the facility to meet current codes. Once refurbished, the facility will chlorinate two Washington Park Reservoir pools and provide secondary water quality treatment for downtown, the Northwest Industrial and Southwest Waterfront Districts, and surrounding neighborhoods and businesses. I'll hand this Back to Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor to present the report. Good morning, Biko. How are you? Good morning, today? Mayor Wheeler. Thank you. Uh, good morning to City Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Biko Taylor. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer. On February 8th, 2023, City Council approved Ordinance 191168 for the completion of this project. At that time, the engineering estimate was $1.85 million and the confidence level was high. Procurement services issued the invitation to bid on May 25th, 2023, and the due date was June 29th, 2023. In total, we received two bids for the, for the project. Uh, two KG Contractors Incorporated was the low bidder and is the recommended awardee. Their bid totaled $1.5 which is roughly 18% below the engineering estimate. 
The city standard 20% aspirational goal applies to this solicitation. And the following is a breakdown of the utilization that 2KG Contractors Incorporated submitted to the procurement team. They will perform 74.3% of the, of the uh, contract. 22% will be performed by certified COVID subcontractors. And 3.6% will be performed by nine certified contractors. Of note, we have Lalande LLC, which is a certified woman-owned business and um, Taurus Power and Controls, which is a certified minority business, Asian Pacific male owned. Uh, 2KG is, is located here in Portland, Oregon, and is not a state COVID certified contractor. They do have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. If there are any, request, if, if there are any additional questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer those. And also, if you have questions about the projects, but in, in particular, we have Chief Engineer Jody Inman in attendance as well. If not, I recommend that council accept this report and authorize ex ex execution of the contract immediately. Very good. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions for Director Taylor at this point? Do we have public testimony? Q no one signed up. All right. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Miller. Aye. The report is accepted. Item 724, also a report, please. Accept bid of ABC Roofing, a Tecta America Company LLC for the 1900 Building Roof Improvements Project for $1,260,780. The facilities team within the Office of Management and Finance oversees the 1900 Building Roof Replacement Project, which I think you're all pretty familiar with at this point. The roof is beyond the 20-year warranty period, resulting in insulation failure and leaks that have caused damage to the office spaces below. This item authorizes various improvements, including the replacement of the existing roof membrane system, inspection of the existing damage, exterior wall repair, as well as necessary safety modifications. Director Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. On March 15, 2023, City Council approved Ordinance 191205 for the completion of the roof project. Um, the engineering estimate was 1.5 million with a high confidence level. Procurement services issued the invitation to bid on June 14, 2023 with a due date of July 6, 2023. In total, we received two bids. ABC Roofing, which is a Tecta American company, was the low bidder and is a recommended awardee. Um, their proposal totaled 1.26 million which is 19% under the original engineering estimate. The city standard 20% aspirational goal does apply to the solicitation and, is a follow, and the following is a breakdown of that utilization. 94% of this project will be self-performed by ABC Roofing and 5% will be um, completed by COVID subcontractors. So for the record, we did fall below the aspirational goal in this project. Um, the winning bidder, they decided to um, put together a plan where they are self-performing the vast majority of the work. Uh, ABC Roofing is located here in Portland, Tech, Portland, Oregon, sorry, and is not a state COVID certified contractor. They have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. At this point, I will take any questions on the procurement process. Questions? Public testimony? No one signed up. I'll accept an, a, a motion. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The report is accepted. 725, please also report. <coughs> Accept bid of Tice Electric Company for the 1900 building LED lighting upgrade project for $1,283,043. So uh, also related to the 1900 building, this is a seven floor urban center condominium that's home to the Bureau of Development Services, the Portland Housing Bureau, as well as the hearings office. The building's existing fluorescent lighting 
and control systems are past their recommended life and need to be replaced. This item authorizes the replacement of the failing existing fluorescent lighting with new energy efficient LED fixtures and modern controls to operate the new system. Director Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. On June 29, 2022, Council approved Ordinance 190900 to replace the lighting in a 1900 building. The engineering estimate at the time was 1.726 million and the confidence level in an estimate was high. Procurement services issued a bid, an invitation to bid on June 15, 2023 with the due date of July 13, 2023. In total, we received four bids for the project. Tice Electric Company is the low bidder. Their proposal came in at 1.283 million, which was 25% below the engineering estimate, substantially lower than some of their competitors. Um, most of the project is electrical work with little to no subcontracting requirements, and the materials are also inclusive here. So I just want to let you know, whoever won the bid probably would have provided the materials and also the services as a package deal. Uh, the city standard 20% aspirational goals apply, and the following is a breakdown. Um, in lieu of the type of work, TICE has elected to complete 100% of the, of the project. And I believe that's probably applicable to the, the, the competitive price that we received here on the bid. TICE Electric is located here in Portland, Oregon. It is not a state COVID certified contractor. They have a current city of Portland business tax and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. If there aren't any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer those now. Colleagues, public testimony. No one signed up. This is a report. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report is accepted. Item 726, a report. Authorized price agreements with S2 Contractors Incorporated, Bricks Paving Northwest Incorporated, Granite Construction Company, and Just Bucket Excavating Incorporated for furnishing asphalt speed bumps, milling, and base repair for $1 million per agreement. Colleagues, this is related to the Bureau of Transportation. They utilize on-call construction contracting to deliver ongoing traffic calming projects within the quick build delivery program. The scope of the work covered by these price agreements is limited to specialty areas such as asphalt, signing, striping, as well as ADA ramps. And uh, we have Director Taylor still here. Good Thank morning you. again. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. On January 18th, 2023, um, City Council approved an exemption ordinance. That ordinance was 191139 and subsequently amended on August 23rd, 2023. So the final ordinance to, um, that approved um, the go ahead was 191426. The engineering estimate for this project was 1 million per year for a total of five years, which is, has a not to exceed value of $20 million. And the confidence level of that estimate was high. Procurement services issued an invitation to bid on May 16, 2023, uh, with a due date of June 8, 2023. In total, we received four bids. The recommended awardees are those that responded to the proposal. Um, that was S2 Contractors Incorporated, Bricks Paving Northwest, Granite Construction Company, and Just Bucket Excavating. I have a few remarks about a price agreement. Bear with me. Price agreements for on-call construction services are intended to be used for projects whose specific scope and budget are not predetermined. Work performed under these price agreements will be authorized via written task orders when projects are identified. The city's equity and contracting aspirational goal did apply for 20% of the hard construction costs for subcontractor and supplier utilization a firm certified by the State Certification Office for Business Inclusion and, diverse, and Diversity. And that those uh, stipulations do apply to the, these price agreements. Each task order will be negotiated to subcontract with so COVID certified firms to the maximum, I'm sorry, the maximum extent possible. 
And just to give you a, a summary, S2, Bricks, Granite, and Just Bucket will all have a first year allocation of 1 million per firm with a maximum of 5 million per firm over five years if, if the demand warrants that. So in total, 25% of this award will be allocated to under an historically underutilized business, which is Just Bucket Excavating. All four um, are Oregon company, with the exception of Granite Construction, which is located in Vancouver. And they all have current city of business port, um, tax registrations and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer those now. Seeing none, public testimony. No one signed up. Very good, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye, the report's accepted. Item seven two seven, an emergency ordinance. Amend city employee benefits program to reflect necessary plan design changes as recommended by the Labor Management Benefits Committee and as administratively required by the Bureau of Human Resources for the city plan offerings beginning October 1st, 2023 through June 30, 2024. Colleagues, the city's Labor Management Benefits Committee reviews the employee benefits program and it provides recommendations for any necessary changes. Due to the off-cycle effective date of Oregon's paid leave program, which begins on September 3rd, it's necessary for us to make additional changes outside of the normal schedule. This ordinance approves changes to the fiscal year 2023-2024 benefit plan documents to address recommendations that were made by the Labor Management Benefits Committee. Benefits Manager Michelle Taylor with the Bureau of Human Resources is here to present the ordinance and walk us through the recommendations. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Michelle Taylor. I'm here representing the Bureau of Human Resources as the Benefit Manager, and I'm presenting an ordinance for your approval this morning. Ordinance 727 authorizes changes to the health plan document beginning October 1, 2023. Generally, our plan document comes to you once per year, but we're bringing forth a change that we need sooner. We're recommending this change take effect October 1st, 2023 in response to the state's Paid Leave Oregon program going live September 3rd. Paid Leave Oregon is a state required income replacement tool which provides employees access to 12 to 14 weeks of family leave, personal medical leave and safe leave. Benefits are set to pay out beginning next week but required employee and employer contributions started in January of this year. Paid Leave Oregon is a generous benefit, paying lower wage earners a higher percentage of salary with a sliding scale for higher income earners and includes expanded leave events and covers family members and close affinity. The city also has a short-term disability plan which requires bureaus to pay for the base plan of 40% and employees can voluntarily purchase a buy-it plan at 20%. Short-term disability is also an income replacement tool, providing employees up to that 60% of their base wages with lower caps on salary than paid leave organ. Short-term disability is just for the employee's own serious illness or injury and can last up to 90 days. In the coming days, the city and our employees will be covered and paying for two similar income replacement tools. Our short-term disability plan will treat paid leave organ benefit payments as deductible income and will reduce someone's expected short-term disability payout. Essentially, we're over-insuring on and after September 3rd. I really wanna thank our partners within the Labor Management Benefit Committee who recognize the urgency to come together off-season to ad address the duplication of benefits and bring these recommendations to you today. The LMBC recommendations include removal of the base and the buy-up short-term disability policy. The second change would be to include uh, enhancements to our long-term disability policy, which um, supports employees who have exhausted their short, shorter term options, such as paid leave organ, but still need continued income replacement to help recover from a serious illness or injury. 
Through our long-standing partnership with Standard Insurance, we're able to increase the base coverage for long-term disability from 40% to 50%, giving more income replacement to our employees. Additionally, those who currently have the buy-up coverage would see their premium decrease as the buy-up coverage would move from 20% to 10% while still maintaining the overall 60% total coverage. This means we can offer more coverage to employees for less cost out of their paycheck. For those employees without the buy-up coverage currently in place, we're able to offer a one-time enrollment period where folks can add the extra 10% of coverage without having it be subject to approval or medical history. So that means employees who have been denied for the long-term disability buy-up coverage in the past can add it during our one-time enrollment period that will start September 8th and end at 9 p.m. on September 25th. This is something we haven't historically been able to do and we're really excited to share the news with employees if this moves forward. In summary, you're approving the removal of our short-term disability policy and approving enhancements to our long-term disability policy effective October 1. While the plan document represents the legal requirements of our health plan, by approving this ordinance, you are also approving the plan design changes recommended by the Labor Management Benefit Committee and for administrative requirements which HR and Benefits Office are responsible to fulfill. These changes are cost neutral to the city as bureau costs previously associated with the short-term disability will be shifted over to cover the um, enhanced long-term disability plan. In addition to thanking the Labor Management Benefit Committee for coming together, I also want to thank our benefit team, who's having to take on an additional enrollment period if this is approved after just having gone through one, um, ensuring that employees have access to cost-effective and beneficial income replacement tools. This concludes my remarks, and I appreciate your support in authorizing this ordinance, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. It's an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. <coughs> Ryan. Great work, Michelle. I vote aye. Wheeler. Thank you. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. 728, this is a non-emergency ordinance. Authorize application to the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance for the FY 2023 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant for $574,225 to assist the Portland Metropolitan Area Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice Community to prevent and reduce crime and violence. Colleagues, this item seeks authorization for the Portland Police Bureau to join in a Department of Justice grant application with both Multnomah County as well as the City of Gresham. Here today to present the PPB's proposed application are Nathan Leamy from the Community Safety Division as well as Jennifer Halling, the Records Division Manager at the Portland Police Bureau. Welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'll share my screen and walk you through a little bit about this application process. Our hope today is to cover the grant itself and background on it, then talk through the application that we have put forward this year. Background on the Justice Assistance Grant. This is a grant program that the Department of Justice established in 2005. It's the primary provider for federal criminal justice funding to local governments. The city of Portland has received this every year since 2005. Just in many ways, same. it's effectively uh, a subsidy. Uh, this ordinance and bringing this to council meets the required governing body review, as well as the public comment period required by the grant. In general, this grant can be used for hiring and retaining personnel, purchasing non-prohibited equipment, uh, training, and information systems. The City of Portland is the primary recipient of this uh, grant. There is a formula that is based on DOJ criminal justice statistics that defines how much money will go to local governments. Uh, the City of Portland retains about 50% of these funds and then acts as the, uh, the fiscal agent for uh, Multnomah County as well as Gresham. This year, Multnomah County will be putting its dollars towards a uh, deputy district attorney. Uh, the city of Gresham will be putting its dollars towards the expansion of Versatur Mobile, a computer-aided dispatch system. 
to provide more details on what the police bureau plans to spend these dollars on, uh, I'll invite Jennifer to speak up. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Holling. I'm the records division manager with the Portland Police Bureau. Um, what we're proposing to use these grant funds for this year is to hire a full-time police records supervisor position uh, for about 22 months. The supervisor position will be focusing on hiring, training, and succession planning efforts for the records division um, during a time when we've had quite significant staffing changes. The position will supervise a team of records staff, uh, provide some strategic direction for our training program, and participate in hiring and onboarding, collaborating with other partners and Bureau staff, developing solutions for addressing existing backlog, low morale, and improving workflow and productivity. That's, that's quite a feat. To plan for upcoming retirements, this position uh, will bridge the gap between current supervisors uh, who are planning to retire and provide some leadership stability for the records division. Next slide. The records division operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, we provide essential services to internal and external stakeholders, including processing police reports, entering data into law enforcement databases, releasing towed vehicles to the public, and responding to public records requests. Since 2020, we've seen a sharp decline in our staffing. Uh, we've lost about, we've actually lost about 50% of our staff, but we have hired back about 20%. Um, our workload has increased and our backlogs have increased. We have seen a significant increase in stolen and recovered vehicle reports, as well as an increase in public records requests. Um, there's been a big push to hire, so we've been hiring a lot of positions. And since 2021, excuse me, 2022, we've hired 21 of our current police records specialists uh, fill, and filled other vacant positions within the division. Next slide. Uh, currently, we stand at 76% staffed, that's 60.5 FTE out of uh, 79 positions. Um, as these vacancies are being filled, the goal would be to add this police records supervisor position to address some critical needs in terms of redistributing workload with the existing supervisors, onboarding and training new staff, uh, addressing some expected attrition and providing leadership stability and continuity, and then also providing better services to members of the public and address, addressing our existing backlog. And finally, this is just a visual representation of where we currently stand in terms of our staffing. The position that we're asking to add would be a, a full participant in hiring these vacant positions and um, completing training for our probationary trainees. All right, thank you. Any questions? Very good. Colleagues, questions on this item? Nathan, could you remind me how th this, this is a long-standing grant. When did it start? Started in 2005. 2005. The city of Portland just received uh, the award every year. Thank uh, you. It's not quite a subsidy, but it's generally treated as such. Very good. Thank you. And um, how when we apply in conjunction with as you say, Multnomah County and the city of Gresham, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean we either all get it or we all don't get it? But what does that mean? Yeah, there's a formula that uh, the federal government puts out that sort of lays some minimum expectations. Generally, the award goes to the largest jurisdiction in a geographic area. So in that case, it's the city of Portland. Uh, the award is split based on um, crime statistics and, and the rates of crime. In addition, the city of Portland has a sort of handshake agreement with the county where we actually go above and beyond uh, what would be legally required for us to share with them uh, based on that sort of longstanding agreement. And, and could you just elaborate on that longstanding agreement for me, just so I'm familiar with it? Why, 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 are, you, why are we going beyond the uh, basic terms the, of the agreement? The politics around it. I will leave to council, um, but uh, there has been funding, at least for the past five years, going towards uh, 0.68 uh, FTE of a deputy district attorney for the I, I Justice Integrity this. Unit, okay. and okay. Uh, there have not been moves to change that thus far. Okay, no, it's, it's jogging my memory. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah. Mayor, thanks. Um, this could be a stretch, but last week we had the report about looking at um, the work that took place in 2020 and beyond. 
and they really spoke to the need for better coordination with our local jurisdictions. Maybe this is a stretch, but is this an example of um, building that system? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I'm sure the people at police recall that report that was delivered last week. Good, thanks. Uh, is I there... guess that was a statement. Oh, so sorry. Jennifer and Nathan <laughs> don't have any comments on that? I was not in attendance for last week's uh, council meeting, so I don't. Know okay, well, call. just FYI, they really spoke to the need for us always building better coordination amongst our different jurisdictions and community safety in regards to our first responders and police. So this just looked like an elegant um, solution and example of how we can keep improving upon that. That's all. Thanks for listening. Yeah, point, point well taken. Public testimony. We have one person signed up. Sangha Demetria McBachlan Hester. Three minutes each, please. Name for the record. My name is, uh, colonial name is Demetria Hester, and my African name is Sangha McBachlan. I'm here to oppose the money that you're giving to your, um, your goon squad as we call them, because you're the police commissioner, so you know what you do with your money. And as he just said, you have all the, what, the say-so of where the money goes. This happens all the time. Y'all have the last say-so of everything, but all of y'all are crooked. All of y'all put the money in your pocket and does not give any to the community. The police who murdered Qantas Hayes, who just beat one of his family members, are they going to get any of this money? Are the parents of the people the police have killed and murdered, are they getting any of this money? No, but you're lining your pockets with the money, and the police are lining their guns with bullets to kill us with you okaying it. This is what you do. This is what our city does. This is what y'all have done being sitting in the office saying that you're helping our people. You're helping the black community, but you're not helping anyone but yourselves. And the police that you put out as your goons to kill us, to murder us, to beat us in the street. In the last month, how many police have killed black children and black people that you gave the okay to? the mayor and the commissioners, y'all give the okay for us to die in the street while you lie about what you're doing with the money. We just heard about what you're going to so-called do with the money. But every time anybody that y'all put in any position investigates anything, you do a horrible job. And then you give each other kudos about how well your staff and y'all are doing good for for the black and BIPOC indigenous people or we're on stolen land. But yet we still hear all the time that y'all have the say so of where the money goes and it does not benefit the families that you've killed, the parents that have to live with the fact that your police target them, patrol them, watch them, make sure that they know that you're watching and that if we get out of line, you're gonna send your police. But this stops here and it stops today. We demand that money to be given to the black community that wants to heal from the torture that you and your comrades do to us every single day. Every single one of you need to resign and your day is numbered. You who remains freedom. Any other public testimony? That completes testimony. Very good, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. All right, uh, why don't, well, let's do one more here and then we'll take a break if you'll remind me to do that. Uh, item number 729, please. 
not authorize a competitive ordinance. solicitation and contract with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Lombard Pump Station and Force Main Upgrade Project E10920 for an estimated amount of $10,200,000. Commissioner Max. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. This ordinance authorizes environmental services to conduct a competitive solicitation to upgrade the Lombard pump station and force main in North Portland. Both the pump station and the force main have exceeded their anticipated useful life. In addition, the force main and pump station roof have experienced failures and leaks in recent years. This project will improve reliability and resiliency and will reduce the risk of pump station failure. The total project cost, including design and overhead, will be approximately $14 million. Uh, this ordinance covers construction costs. Construction is scheduled to begin on 2024 and will conclude in the year 2026. Here to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Cyrus Osborne, a project manager with Environmental Services. And I believe we ha also have uh, Bargavi Embagar, a division manager with environmental services. I'll turn it over to uh, staff now. Good morning. Give me just one second to ensure that I'm sharing properly. Have I frozen up? I'm not seeing uh, your presentation quite yet. Okay. Let's just give it a second. Sharing, but, um, Well, Cyrus, the rule here at council is if it doesn't come up, you have to act it out. There you go. Oh, okay. This is, I'm up to, for some interpretation here, some interpretive stylings. Okay, I think I might finally be catching up here. All right. Can you all see my screen? Not yet. No. Keelan, what if he emails it to you? Then can you share it? Cyrus, would you like us to bring it up? Sure, you've got the PDF. Great. Ah, there it is. I see it now. Okay. And I'll just let you know when I'm when I'm switching slides, all right? Yeah, that okay. works. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your patience through that. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Maps. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and members of council. I am Cyrus Osborne, and I'm an engineer at the Bureau of Environmental Services. I'm here today to request council approval of an ordinance to authorize solicitation, contract, and payment for the construction of the Lombard Pump Station and Force Main Upgrade Project. Lombard Pump Station was constructed between North Lombard Street and the Columbia Slough in 1983 with a firm uh, capacity of 9 million gallons per day and it has ex exceeded its designed and anticipated useful life. The basic requirements of the project are to bring the station into conformance with current BES standards for operations, reliability, safety, and resiliency to ensure that it can continue to serve the surrounding area of North Portland for decades to come and help reduce time to reestablish service after a seismic event. Uh, regarding the force main, which is the pumped wastewater line coming out of the pump station, it's oversized and in December of 2017, it experienced a failure necessitating emergency repairs. Shortly thereafter, resizing and replacement of the force main became a project requirement. Uh, on screen, to get us oriented, the pump station is at the extreme northeast end of North Columbia Boulevard, uh, where it used to transition into being named North Lombard Street. Uh, from there, the force main runs under Columbia Boulevard and eventually under Chimney and Pier Parks, where we have our discharge manholes. Uh, top right, we have a reminder of what 40-year-old infrastructure looks like in the dry well. And at the bottom right, we have an action shot of the emergency repairs, which again took place in 2017. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the project objectives for the pump station include direct replacement and upgrade of many of the components at the current pump station. This includes all mechanical and electrical components, such as the pipes, or excuse me, such as the pumps and the motor control center, all instrumentation and communications equipment, 
architectural and structural improvements, including a new green roof with fall protection, an upgraded bathroom, and improved wet well and dry well access, including a larger code compliant spiral staircase. Uh, we'll also provide upgraded site security features, including a taller perimeter fence and remote operated access gate. So on screen, we've got a photo of the dry well and pumps in their current condition, uh, showing obvious wear, juxtaposed with the 3D rendering of the upgraded pumps, valves, and appurtenances in the dry well. Uh, the new pumps will be smaller, and we anticipate uh, increased energy efficiency. Uh, the project, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project also includes adding new features to the pump station to bring it into conformance with current standards. Uh, those features are an on site standby generator and automatic transfer switch, uh, a flow meter and flow meter vaults, uh, a force main inspection and cleaning tool launching station an on-site air release valve and influent, influent control manhole, influ, excuse me, influent control maintenance hole and deep soil mixing ground improvements to protect the pump station in case of a seismic event. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the resizing and replacement of the 4,800 foot long force main will mainly be accomplished by slip lining a new 18 inch high density poly polyethylene pipe into the existing mixed material 30 inch force main. Additionally, 100 feet of the force main nearest the pump station will be replaced with earthquake-resistant ductile iron pipe. Uh, two air release valves and vaults are to be installed in the force main, and the discharge maintenance hole structures in uh, Pier Park will be upgraded. So on screen, we have a detail for the slip lining. It's a pipe within a pipe, and a plan sheet showing the location of one of the 14 force main access pits uh, we anticipate the contractor using to access the existing force main and perform the slip lining. We've secured street opening permit from the uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation for excavation of the access pits in Columbia Boulevard right away, and we're working closely with parks to finalize our non-parks use permit for the work in Chimney and Pier Parks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the total project budget is 14 million, and the current engineer's estimate of probable construction cost is 10.2 million. If contractor bids exceed the amount currently budgeted for construction contract in the project budget, Additional funds are available in the pump station shell. Uh, in terms of schedule, we're very near the end of design, and we anticipate being in construction spring of 2024. Next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, I'm here today to request council approval of an ordinance to authorize solicitation, contract, and payment for the construction of the Lombard uh, Force Main and Pump Station Upgrade Project. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Very good. Colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? Do we have public testimony on this? No one signed up. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cyrus. Appreciate it. Uh, why don't we go ahead and take a 10-minute break at this particular juncture? It is now uh, 11.30. We'll reconvene at 11.40. We're in recess. <laughs>
consent item before we get to the four fifths. We'll do item 715 from the consent agenda, please. Reappoint Tia Palafox, Joseph Torres Ortiz, Byron Vaughn, and Robin Weisner to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing for terms to expire August 31st, 2025. Colleagues, this item reappoints several of our existing Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing or PSEP members who've opted to renew their terms. Before we begin, I do want to note that we will have new PSEP member appointments, new members coming to council in the next two to three weeks and will at that point again have a full PSEP membership, which is exciting. With us today is PSEP's program manager, Dori Grabinski, and Samir Kanal, both of the Community Safety Division, to tell us about the reappointments that are up for discussion today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Dori Grabinski, and I'm the project manager of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing also known as PSEP. As you know, PSEP is a mayoral committee tasked with ensuring that community voice is represented in the ongoing implementation of the city's settlement agreement with the Department of Justice. PSEP also offers community members a chance to give input on a broad range of issues related to policing in Portland and makes recommendations to the mayor and chief of police. I am here today to request the reappointment of four ongoing PSEP members, Tia Palafox, Byron Vaughn, Robin Weisner, and Joseph Torres Ortiz. These members have been instrumental to PSEP's success over the past year as we've worked to restore internal function and culture. We look forward to their continued leadership over the next term as PSEP turns its focus to deeper community engagement and bringing more Portlanders into the policymaking process. I am happy to read bios for these members at your request, but otherwise, this concludes my presentation. Very good. Do we have public testimony on this item? We have one person signed up, uh, Barbara Baczynski. Why don't we hear from Barbara first? Hi, Barbara. Barbara, you're muted. There you are. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and members of City Council. Uh, I'm Barbara Boshinsky, a member of Portland Cop Watch. We have no concerns about the individuals being reappointed today. We would like to thank Ann Campbell for her tenure on the committee and for standing up for community voices and to for Gloria Canson for bringing her vast experience to the group. As was noted by the compliance officer in their last report on the US DOJ settlement agreement, the PSEP does not have anyone filling its youth seats. It also appears nobody is placed. Oh, and now you, I guess you are replacing those people. So the people, um, but now that there's only 10 people. And so we, that can happen in the future. So we've been, um, we are wanting that, well, I'll get to that later, wanting to have a different um, quorum number. We've been pleased to see the PSEP with the help of city staff be so active in the past year, holding important community forums on crowd control, gun detection technology, and the settlement agreement. The mayor's office could take note about PSEP's ability to turn out people at these forums, hold them on regular Zoom calls rather than as webinars, and publicizing them well in advance. The city has been promising for around two years to put the PSEP into city code. This will help ensure that it will last beyond the end of the settlement agreement as Mayor Wheeler said he wants to do when he spoke to the group earlier in August. Portland Cop Watch is hoping this codification will happen sooner than later. We strongly urge the city council to set PSEP's quorum to be a majority of seated members instead of a majority of the 13 seats. That would mean that right now, they could meet with just six members present rather than seven. The code could set a low cutoff to be sure that the PSEP never has a quorum lower than a certain number which we suggest would be five people. That way, if the membership falls below 10, the quorum of five would allow them to meet. And we have to think ahead. I mean, the, given the administration right now might be on top of it, but we don't know what happens down the road. So um, the county's charter review commission was re required in the county charter to have 16 members. When one person stepped down, they changed their quorum from nine to eight. We've heard this was because there was no provision to replace the members. 
That supports our reading of the state meetings handbook and the ruling that cited about vacancies. We believe the ruling states that the body that creates a board or commission can set the quorum in law, code, or policy. The statement that vacancies don't matter when it comes to a quorum is a citation from a ruling on a 1989 case regarding the Board of Public Safety and Training, as it was called then. The ruling stated that the BPST could not ignore vacancies when it comes to quorum because the law establishing their board <clears throat> set their membership at 14. Thus, we believe that if council sets PSEP membership at 13, but their quorum is a majority of seated members, it will meet the state standard. When Portland Cop Watch called the state authority on this matter, they said they could not offer advice unless we worked for a municipality and we're asking them to review a proposed piece of legislation. Thus, we urge city council to write the sliding scale quorum into the PSEP code and ask the state to rule on this. Then you won't have to hear from us again on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, and, and, and Barbara, could I just, uh, and thank you, uh, we appreciate your testimony today, and I, I know this issue has come forward previously. Uh, uh, Mark and, and Dan regularly <laughs> raise this issue, and I, I just want you to hear what I'm thinking on it, and maybe you could react to it. Obviously, a committee like this requires legitimacy in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of uh, those who are overseen by this process. And we know that the public is divided on issues related to public safety. And one concern, one concern that I would have by lessening the quorum rules is that you potentially end up with an unbalanced committee. In other words, unbalanced perspectives making key decisions about accountability and oversight. And that would strike me as a blow to the legitimacy of this committee. It seems to me that the better solution is to do what we're doing, which is work very, very diligently with our staff to make sure that those seats are filled. And as, as you just heard, uh, we're reappointing four people, with a, which I think is a strong statement of support from those who are currently on the committee, that they believe this committee matters, that it's working, that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that their time as volunteers is well spent. And in addition to that, a couple of weeks, we're going to have a full slate of individuals as we appoint new members to this committee. So why, why isn't that a better strategy than reducing the quorum rules to the point where potentially the committee no longer represents a broad array of interests, but in fact represents a narrow range of interests that, that could potentially harm the legitimacy of this oversight panel. I see your point. I can see your point that that could happen. Um, we're concerned because in the past and possibly in the future, you know, down the road a few years, um, maybe, I mean, I think the best strategy obviously is to keep a full, a full board. That's definitely the best strategy. Sometimes it's hard to find volunteers. Sometimes it, you know, takes time to get them on board. And so that would, this would be a stopgap. Okay, well, I, and I, I appreciate- could I, could I respond to Barbara as well? Uh, uh, sure, yeah, we're having yeah, a Barbara, conversation. Barbara, as always, I, I really appreciate your thoughtful feedback. I think staff has also thought a lot about this question. And in particular, we have some um, hesitation about the equity impacts that reducing the quorum would have. I think if you consider um, in particular who um, is most available most of the time to attend every meeting mm. um, and, and the likely impacts that um, adjusting the quorum down might have in terms of who would most often be casting the votes. Um, so that's something that we have considered as well. And so there's no perfect solution, but but we do tend to, to think that the efforts we're making towards recruitment, and we did have a robust one this time, we're encouraged by that. Um, we're, we're hoping that that will be a, a better long-term solution. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dory, thank, thank you for I that see your perspective. Good, all right, well, well uh, Barbara, thank you for being here and, and uh, sharing your perspective. This was a, a good conversation. Uh, is there any other public testimony? No, that completes On this way. item? Um, very good, colleagues, any thoughts or comments on this item? Okay. This this was an emergency. No, it's a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Aye. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. 
Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Reports accepted. Last but not least, the four fifths agenda item number 730, please. Authorized Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a five year contract with Voya Financial for Retirement Plan Administration, Investment Services, and Deferred Compensation Record Keeping Services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources Benefits Office beginning September 1st, 2023. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes a new contract with our current vendor, Voya Financial, to provide retirement as well as plan administration, investment, and deferred compensation record keeping services on behalf of the Benefits Office within the Bureau of Human Resources. We have Benefits Manager Michelle Taylor from the Bureau of Human Resources to present the ordinance. Welcome. Hello again. Um, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. I'm Michelle Taylor, representing the Bureau of Human Resources as the Benefit Manager, presenting Ordinance 730 to you, which authorizes the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a five-year contract with VOIA Financial, providing retirement plan administration, investment services, and deferred compensation record keeping services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources Office uh, beginning September 1st, 2023. Our current contract with FOIA Financial is set to end August 31st, so we competed, uh, completed a competitive request for proposal process utilizing the special procurement rules for benefit contracts. A selection committee comprised of city employees, labor representatives, and an outside deferred compensation uh, consultant reviewed the proposals and selected the most advantageous. After thorough analysis of multiple responses and interviewing finalists, VOIA was awarded the contract. Contracting with a deferred compensation record keeping group ensures the city has a specialized group to manage our deferred compensation plan and investments on behalf of plan participants. VOIA Financial will continue to be responsible for overall plan administration, investment services, and record keeping while protecting the city's plan in a fiscally responsible way. With this new contract, lower fees were negotiated and the VOIA fixed account will see a higher interest rate return, preserving plan participant contributions. With this new contract, we will also expand access to employee education, group enrollment sessions, and targeted outreach for plan participants and those who have yet to elect. Employees will be able to enroll, change contribution amounts, and update beneficiaries from their phones rather than having to enroll from a city uh, device, which will remove barriers to accessing these important financial services. We have 60 to 65% at any given time of our employees actively enrolled in a voluntary deferred compensation program. Our plan has over 1 billion in assets. It's important for us to build programs that are meaningful, accessible, and relevant. The deferred compensation budget within the general fund has sufficient appropriation in support of the benefit contract communicated today. This concludes my remarks and I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Very good, colleagues, Thank any you. questions on this ordinance? Do we have public testimony? No one signed up. Very good, call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Important service, thank you for bringing it forward and thanks for your continued diligence. I vote aye, the ordinance is adopted and we're adjourned. See you all at two.